I think one thing that we have to learn in life is that God is faithful. What does it mean that God is faithful? That's, that's a nice, it means we can count on Him. Oh, I know He doesn't always respond the way we want Him to. I know He doesn't always come when we want Him to. But God has our best interest at heart and in mind and He is faithful. We can count on Him. We, we have to believe that. I was talking to my friend, Charles and Delilah are probably on tonight, and I was talking to Charles uh, uh, years ago, probably after I went to Canada. There was a young man who seemed to be so on fire for the Lord. And uh, he wound up divorcing his wife and committing suicide. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, Charles was very close to him, and he even came to Charles with a suicide letter, and Charles talked him out of it and, and so on, but he wound up doing it anyway. But anyway, I asked Charles, I said, what, what would you say led him to do that? He said uh, he became very frustrated and despondent because God wouldn't do and, uh, things the way he wanted God to do them. You know, he was praying and supposedly believing God and fasting. Uh, but uh, this is what Charles was saying. He, God wouldn't do things when and how he wanted him to do it. And he got very frustrated and despondent and so on. Folks, don't ever forget just because life doesn't go, just because life is not always easy, just because there are challenges, don't ever let go of the fact that God is faithful. You can count on Him. Persevere through the difficult times. Don't ever stop trusting. Don't ever stop hoping. Don't ever give up. And so here's a little song we were singing, uh, I want to sing, and I remember singing this at the uh, God's Word to Women conference we had last fall, and I started singing this in Fern up in Nova Scotia. I hope you're on the streaming now. Uh, you were having trouble picking it up. Fern started singing this with her beautiful voice, and what a blessing it was, and we sung this over and over. And I believe it's appropriate tonight for all of us, but for someone in particular. Thus the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And they are new every morning. Oh, they're new every morning. <laughs> Great thy faithfulness O Lord and great is thy faithfulness I'm going to sing it again if you'd like to sing it with me the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercy never come to an end. Oh, they are new every morning. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. got to sing it one more time. The steadfast love of our Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Oh, they are new every morning. Oh, they're new And great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray together that everyone's heart and mind will be renewed tonight in God's faithfulness. And I'd like for us to pray together that everywhere this stream goes tonight, People will be touched at the point of their need. Bodies will be healed. Hope will be renewed. 
minds will be and hearts will be refreshed. Confidence will be restored. Confidence in God's faithfulness will be restored tonight. Lord, we do thank you tonight for this time together. We're so thankful, Lord, for what you're doing through this stream and how you're touching lives, you're connecting people together. I give you praise, I give you glory for it all tonight, Lord, and we're so thankful for what the mighty things that you have done. But we're even more thankful, Lord, for what you're going to do in the days ahead. You know, this is the month of Thanksgiving. Here's a little, a little course just comes to my mind. We need to be thankful, both for, both for what God has done and what he's going to do. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. Yes, Lord. For all that you've promised and all that you are. It's all that has carried me through. And Jesus, I thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to leave the prayer room. And I uh, hope all of you will let's turn our attention to what God wants to do tonight and say through us. And I'm going to have to turn off my... <laughs> because I'm getting myself... Hi, feeding Jen. back. Uh, she says, I've been at Calgary here. I've been singing this song all week. So happy to be able to join tonight. So excited. My furnace isn't working, so I'm sitting with a fire in the fireplace and electric heater at my feet. Tw uh, minus 20 tonight. Eeks. Warm in spirit, happy in heart. Grateful for you all, Jan. Oh, Jan, our friend Jan Muth up in Calgary. Up in Calgary. God bless you, Jan. So glad you're on with us tonight. And I'm so thankful for this stream. And, and we got an email today. Uh, I'm just going to read just a, a, a little portion of it because it so blessed me to see how God is using this stream to connect people in relationships in, in different parts of the world. And uh, this come from, uh, came from our friend uh, Margaret O'Healy in Ballinasloe, Ireland. And uh, she was just telling us because they, they have to get up very early in the morning, she wasn't going to be able to be on tonight, um, and she really misses it. But she said, um, she mentioned Carmel, who's on tonight. Carmel, you're on tonight, and Carmel is in another city. And she says, I hope to visit her tomorrow. So you may be getting a visit tomorrow, uh, uh, Carmel. And then she says, thinking of your friend Valerie today, give her my love. Well, Valerie lives in Irving, Texas. And she says, praying for Linda Miller at this time. Linda lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> and she says, I, I tried phoning Jatana, read on Facebook how David was in the hospital in Wales. Well, Jatana and David are from McKinney, Texas, and are, they've been in Ireland now in Wales. But see, these connections that all she's mentioning here, just naturally flowing out, have come about because of this stream, how God is connecting people, connecting hearts together. Folks, God is doing something good. God is doing special. We're living, in, I believe, in a special time when God said it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters prophesy, old men dream dreams, young men see visions, and upon my servants and my handmaidens. Those were the lowest of society. I will pour out of my spirit in those days. Universal worldwide work of God, the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful time to be alive. And I'm so thankful that God is, has provided us with this studio the means, the equipment to reach out all over the world. And I'm so thankful that you all are a part of our lives and a part of our ministry. Thank you so much. Um, I want to read a question. Sue just had to uh, leave for just a moment. We had, we had lunch with a couple from uh, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, the capital, Daniel Chia and Deborah Ong. Now, they're married, but in their culture, they all keep their, their same names. 
And uh, a beautiful couple, we had never met them before, but we have mutual friends who know them. Our friend Marie Brown goes every year and ministers in their church, and they have branched out, and they have networks of churches and so on. And uh, they've been wanting to meet us for a long time. They've invited us to Malaysia. We have not gone there up to this time. But anyway, they were here in the area, so we got together yesterday, had a very blessed time. Uh, it was so blessed we decided to get together again Thursday before they leave. And we may, uh, we'll show them about streaming. Yeah, and, and, uh, they have several churches across Southeast Asia. Right, so anyway, this... Hold up the picture. Uh, oh, this is, this is a picture of... Uh, Daniel and Deborah uh, love God with all their heart, wanting to reach the world for Jesus. So, uh, uh, you know, they haven't developed a network of, of churches. And uh, so we're going to share with them about streaming. I don't know if they... That's right. They use, Sue's, they, Sue, they use Sue's book on equality. They're committed to the message of equality. And uh, they use Sue's book as, as the textbook for a course that they teach not only in their church, but in all of these other uh, places in Asia where they have connections. So, folks, God is helping us. It's amazing in, in ways that, you know, sometimes w w that are not so big and obvious. God is helping us to reach out all over the world. It's, it's a wonderful thing what God is doing. And I am so thankful for what God is doing through this stream uh, God is just, you know, bringing people together and, and, and we relate on different levels. I know for some people out, out there, this is your church. And some, some other people r relate different ways, but that's okay. We're flowing together in the Spirit, flowing out of our hearts and letting God connect us uh, the way He wants us to be connected in the body of Christ and with one another. Oh, and Sue, Sue's got something. This is between her and Carmel. I don't even know what this is about, but there is something between Sue and Carmel and Athlone that Sue wants me to show Carmel this butterball turkey. I guess this is our turkey for Thanksgiving. I saw it the first time today. <laughs> so, Carmel, whatever this is about, there it's it about is. We all look it's about we all look after each other. We all look I after each other. It's just we all look after each other. It's you powerful. It's powerful. No, it's just powerful. Yeah, just yeah. That that God God wants us to look after one another. That's good, Sue. You know, when 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 one of when when someone connected with us, when God's connected us with people, and somebody's sick, God wants us to pray for them. If we know they they need encouragement, God wants us to encourage them. Uh, you know, God wants us to reach out to one another and uh, and not hold not hold back. Go ahead, don't hold back. Flow out, reach out, encourage, touch somebody, encourage someone. Hallelujah! Yeah, that's God wants us to help one another. That's so good, Sue. Thank you. And a couple of people have birthdays today. Oh yes, we want to thank. I don't know if our friend Linda Miller is on. Linda has a birthday today, and Linda is. No, I'm not going to tell anybody's age. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Linda. Uh, but Linda, we prayed that uh, that this coming year that you will experience health in your body. You will experience God's connections and open doors and God's blessing as never before. And uh, we love you and appreciate you. And uh, you're a God-given friend. And also Eileen Kinney. Most of you know Paul and Eileen. Eileen Kinney uh, in uh, Manville, Texas has a birthday today. And what a blessing Paul and Eileen are. And Eileen, we pray for you and for Paul. You're a team. And we just pray that this coming year will be the most blessed and wonderful year that you have ever had. And that Eileen, you will experience complete restoration there in that eye that you've had a challenge with. May it be in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And, and in relation to healing eyes, let's take, take encouragement because Judy Hamilton, wow. after one year of solid, just intense blindness and, and so on. You have your microphone on? She is now... 
That's you, true. 100%. Wow. Hundred percent. Yeah. That. This boy. is amazing. It, it and is. So it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. That's right, so, yeah. Uh, and he who began a good work in you will continue it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen, Sue. Can you sing, It Is No Secret What God Can Do? I, 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 I believe I can do that, Sue. It is no secret, an old, uh, an old song, it is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. God, God doesn't have any favorites. Mm -hmm. Well, say that one again. God doesn't have any favorites. The chimes of time bring out the news that another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. And was that someone you? You may have long for added strength, your courage to remove. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope to you. It is no secret what God can do, what He's done for others. For you, and with arms wide open, He will pardon you. For it is no secret what God can do. I just feel in my heart somebody needs to just reach out in faith and just take. No, in, in the Bible, the word receive means to actively take, actively take by faith. Say, Lord, I receive, I choose to receive now. I, I feel like somebody right now as we sing this course again, you need to just reach out in faith and say, Lord, I receive, I take by faith that which you have promised because it is no secret what God can do and what he's done for others he will do for you and with arms wide open he will pardon you and it is no secret what God Well, every we, uh, week, we every, thought every uh, yeah. very often we receive emails, we receive questions yeah. from people we don't know from mm -hmm. around the world yeah. uh, who stumble upon our websites, especially God's Word to Women uh, dot org. And so I said to you yesterday, why don't we take these questions and answer one each week? Because yeah. if one person has that question on their mind and they're willing to email us to find an answer, yeah. then there must be others as well. So this is the one that came this week. Eddie, would you like to take that and address it? It's uh, from Kate uh, in the UK. First time we've ever heard from this person. It came to the God's Word to Women email, didn't it, Susie? Yes, yes. And uh, uh, let me just look. I'll read the, the entire email. She says, Hello, I've been reading your articles, which are very encouraging. I'm sure I read somewhere of a Bible translation you recommended. Could you tell me of any translation you recommend? I am looking for myself, but also for my 16-year-old son, who is as fed up as I am about the impression given of, given of women by most translators. Well, if you want a, a, a gender-friendly translation that is accurate, faithful to the original languages, here are some that I would recommend. Uh, I would recommend the New Living Translation, and I email this back to this person, the New Living Translation. I would also recommend the New Revised Standard Version, NRSV, New Living Translation, NLT. Many times they, they go by the abbreviation. So the NLT, New Living Translation, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, and the NIV, the 2011 edition. Now, 
The NIV first came out in 1984, became very popular, probably maybe second only to the King James. But, uh, but they did a new edition in 2011 where they, they made some advances and corrections more faithful to the original language. Uh, for example, in places like uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where, it's, where Paul said to Timothy, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, that commit to faithful and the old translations, the King James, even the New King James says to faithful men who shall, be, well, the New King James might have people, but it says who shall be able to teach others also. The older translation said men, but actually the old NIV said men, but actually the Greek word calls for a gender inclusive word like people. That's more accurate. So the 2011, if you like the NIV, then get the new 2011 edition of the NIV. Uh, because it's more accurate in that regard. And since these folks live in England, I uh, recommended the NIV UK edition, which came out quite a number of years ago. So those are some that I would recommend. Now, the new, the, the, the new King James Version, I use it actually. Um, it is not always accurate when it's translating uh, gender words that should be gender inclusive. It's accurate otherwise. Uh, but, uh, so if, if you want to use a new King James, I would recommend it too, but, uh, but resort, look at other, these other translations I'm talking about where it's relating to, to gender specific or gender inclusive issues. So that's, if you have further questions about that, feel free to ask. And if you want to email a question, we'll pick one out each week and, uh, um, and, and talk about it. Now let me just say something about translations. Here's the thing. We don't have a perfect translation. We have a perfect Savior. We have a perfect Lord. We have a perfect Master. We don't have a perfect translation, but they are reliable. They are reliable. We don't even have the original Gospels that Matthew wrote. We don't have the original letters that Paul wrote. What we have are multitudes of copies. And people who do the translations, scholars have taken all these mass of manuscripts and created a Greek text that then the translators work from. And the Greek text tells which manuscripts, you know, have this passage in it and so on, so that they are able to make a very accurate translation. So there's no questions our translations are reliable. Any of the translations that we would use would not be problematic concerning any of the major doctrines of Christianity. I mean, you could use the King James, the New King James, or any of them to get saved with. Now, here is an area of caution. There's always translations coming out. Mm -hmm. I'm always cautious if it's a translation produced by a single person. Absolutely. Why is that, Eddie? Because many times a single person has an agenda. Exactly. And uh, it's one thing to have an agenda and want to produce a translation to fit your agenda, but it's another thing to have a goal of producing a translation that accurately translates God's message to this contemporary world. Uh, now, let me give you an example. And, and this is a positive example of this. The Living Bible was produced, what was his name, Sue? Ken Taylor. Ken Taylor. Now, he was a good man, and, and, uh, but he didn't call it a translation. Well, you know he, he called it a paraphrase. He, he has been a missionary and he had to come home from the field because he lost his voice. And so he spent that time translating the New Test, the, the Bible for his large family. And uh, my brothers and I actually went to camp on Prince Edward Island with Ken Taylor's son. Mm -hmm. But Billy Graham was friends with Ken Taylor and he's the one who picked up on this translation, this paraphrase that Ken Taylor had done for his family and had it published and then promoted it. Well, now we have, 
we, it was always acknowledged that it was a paraphrase. N not really but, a translation. It right. was written starting out for his kids to exactly, try to help them. Exactly, exactly. But now we have the new living translation. Which is, which is a translation. It's much more accurate. Right. And they say in the, in the introduction, don't they, that they're, they made every effort to accurately translate. Uh, to, to be faithful ahead. to what the original manuscripts say, but to make it understandable in, in the modern world. So that when it came to Greek words like anthropos, they were willing to accurately translate that. As not persons as man, or people. But as persons, human beings, men and women, boys and girls. That's being accurate with a gender inclusive translation, not a paraphrase, mm -hmm. a translation. Right, right. So just be cautious of, of translations that are obviously um, produced by a group okay, that has is, an agenda or an axe to grind and so is, on? This is a good question from Carmel. She questions about the Message Bible. Yes. I try not to be negative or to speak <laughs> out against that, but in that it's being asked, I'm going to, I know I've done a lot of reading by the by Peterson, is that his name, who did the we, paraphrase? It is a paraphrase. We it had to read. We had to, to read a, a number of his books when we were in our doctoral program. Right, and uh, it is not. It is not a translation. It, he imposes his uh, his understanding on the passages, and it's not a translation. And I definitely do not recommend it because. I know something about the person who's doing the paraphrasing, and I'm not impressed. Okay, there you Is go, that Carmel. Okay? There's, Did I say there's, that all right? There's Sue's summary. Yep. Amen. Okay, uh, let's move on to. Uh, okay, Sue, I what? wanted to encourage people to who have not yet become a part of um, of God's Word to Women Facebook group. You know, there's so much happening. Uh, that even by reporting weekly by email mm -hmm. to people, yeah. they miss so much. If, if you have any interest in this at all, I know some people wouldn't be interested, but if you have any interest at all, join up with the God's Word to Women group. There are over 2,000 people now, um, members of that group. 2,350. And, and of course, we don't know these people. Most of them. So those of you who, whom we know and we trust, it's very helpful to have people whom we know and trust yes. that can go there and post things yes. that we know that we can trust and that are accurate and, and wholesome and upbuilding. And have a good attitude. And, and with an, a good attitude. So... Uh, we want it to be a safe place. We, we for want it to people. be a safe place for people. And so it's, it's not a place to debate and argue. It's a place. It's an educational site. Right. So we welcome you to come and be a part of that God's Word to Women and group. And for those who are enrolled in the college or interested yep. in God's Word to Women College, uh, they can join at GWTW College, and that will bring them. And then there is there are a number of ways that people in God's Word to Women pray for one another. And this is the open group. It's called GWTW Prayer Place. Right. Okay, so then... Um, I guess we should move on, Eddie. Yeah, so, let's keep moving. All right. So this is the lesson today, the course. This is lesson seven of what Jesus taught about the image of God in women. Right. You're teaching. We do research and development. And some people are working toward credit. And so here's what you do. You register with Rhonda Klug at mm -hmm. this email address. Right. Make sure you get the books if you don't already have them. There they are, and there are rec there's recommended reading. Mm, right. uh, these are available on GodsWordToWomen.org. Make sure you do the homework, read the assigned pages, uh, study each lecture either via streaming or on demand at the archives. And each Tuesday we'll archive those by those that lesson by Friday at God's Word to Women Inc the YouTube channel. Right. And then uh, finally take the exam. It's open book, nothing to be afraid of. Uh, and you take it when you're ready. So before we get into the lesson, Eddie, each week I really like to review okay. sure. what has gone before in the previous six lessons because we're building s towards something. We're building here. These all inter wine. So the first thing we need to understand, and could you go through these as I flip the... Uh, patriarchy, patri comes from two words, patri meaning father 
an arc meaning rule. So patriarchy is the idea that the man is the ruler in society, in the home and in society, that, it, that, that he's created that way, is the commonly held paradigm driving biblical interpretation. It is rooted in pagan presuppositions that women are evil, inferior, unequal, and unclean. And that's an important, uh, those four words are very important. And, and we'll elaborate on that with sure. some of the church fathers in sure. a moment. Uh, the Bible teaches that women and men are equal in substance and value, privilege and responsibility, function and authority. Can I just make a comment there, Sue, on sure. something sure. that I put in my notes, but, uh, but, but it, it fits right in with that. And this is from the Shumash, a, uh, a Jewish commentary on the Torah. And, uh, and they point out that unlike the man's body, the woman's body was not taken from the earth. God built one side of the, in, in, in the scripture he's called an anthropos, of, of the man into a woman so that the single human being became two. And, and this is what they say, thereby demonstrating irrefutably the equality of man and woman. These are the, the Jewish rabbis saying this. What they're pointing out, and I thought of this when you say that men, the Bible teaches men and women are equal in substance, because there you see they're pointing out that when God created the woman, He didn't take more dirt from the ground or another substance somewhere. They're of the very same essence and the very same substance. Now that's really important because we see in the church fathers who had pagan mindsets about mm -hmm. where women came from. Yeah, they believe what, that pagan... What, do we, what, do we, what did you read today that's in my book about uh, where they said, one said they're made from an, a pig's ear, uh, a woman is made from an inferior substance. Yeah, yeah, the, um, the, they, they believe that, that men and women... You know, there's this, this uh, popular book from a number of years ago, Women Are From Venus and Men Are From Mars. It, it's kind of reflecting in a modern way this idea that men and women are so different. And the pagans said they're so different they must have been made from two different sources. The male substance being superior, the female substance being inferior. But, but this biblical shows that they're both from the very same substance and from the very same essence and the Jewish rabbis say that this demonstrates the equality of the man and the woman. Okay. So that's powerful. Right. And our way of thinking about women has been shaped by the authorities in our lives but this course presents the Creator's view of His female creation. Right. And the course presents the biblical way of thinking about womanhood to help renew our minds in God's view of womanhood. Uh, so we begin with Jesus, and Jesus chose and commissioned both men and women disregarding fallen culture and religion. Now, these are, these are, are uh, Theses. These are statements, mm -hmm. overarching statements mm -hmm. that we broke down and explained in the various lessons as we went along. So then here's something. Want to take that one? Jesus didn't teach male headship and female submission. Jesus didn't teach men rule and women serve. Now, why is this important for anybody new? Why is this important? Well, because there is such a need all the, the, the body of Christ is so weak in America and around the world mm -hmm. because all of the members are not fully functioning in their gifts because of wrong thinking and theology. There is a large church not too far from us that has influence all over the world. Yes. They will not allow women to fulfill any kind of roles uh, of what they would consider that has any authority. Those are all reserved for men. So how many women who are being influenced to that, their gifts are being quenched. So this, folks, what we're doing has ramifications for the church worldwide, for world missions, for evangelism. Uh, and, and so this, this is so very important. And so then we, we noted that even though this wasn't in Jesus' teaching, this was, I mean, Jesus knew about Deborah. Here's her profile. Deborah was a judge, that is, she had supreme civil authority. She was a prophet. She spoke God's mind without that having to be uh, analyzed and approved by a man or somebody else. She was, she was 
the prophet. And she was a wife. So there you have a married woman being functioning in this these places of civil and religious authority not only that but she was a leader in battle and war that just blows she wasn't an exception but it her 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 activity blows the theories about women as secondary out of the water i, I was this this reminded me because deborah takes up two chapters her husband is miss is mentioned once in passing in one verse just his name is all it is, and then she's mentioned all of her exploits in two chapters. <laughs> but anyway, this reminded me, Sue, when I was in Paris the last time, yes. there was a young guy came by, and I remember from him when he was a kid, I used to say, play with a singing group, and he was a little kid, his family's in the singing group, and he played the drums, and he came by and he was talking, and apparently he married a woman who, who has been very well known in gospel music and, and she's right now I think the president of the Southern Gospel Association and so on. So uh, somebody there at the table said, oh, you're her, you're her, her husband. <laughs> so he said, oh, he said, I had a struggle. With, of course, he's been married yeah. for a long time. He said, I had a struggle with that for a long time. He said, but I've gotten over it. It's okay. I'm, I don't mind being known as, and he called Some her name as, as her husband. <laughs> Okay. And so anyway, for any men in that situation, you have, we have to be willing to be, hey, I don't mind being known as Sue's husband. husband. <laughs> you had to stop and think I had to stop that. and think about that. <laughs> so in this particular lesson, we were talking about biblical ministry uh, and w how women can function in ministry. And anything that God calls a woman to do, she is able to do it. He equips. Yeah. And biblical ministry, we explored... Uh, this definition is not defined as office. The word office does not appear in the in the Greek tr um, manuscripts of the Bi of the New Testament. Any place that word appears, it ought to be in italics, which is an indicator that the translators put the, inserted that word, and yet. Most churches today seem to be built on the idea of ministerial offices. How unbiblical can we get? And I, go ahead, you're smiling. Oh, I'm smiling at you because it's obvious. Uh, I'm just saying this to the people. Isn't it obvious that Sue has, has a teaching gift? It's flowing out. And I'm smiling because before we started and uh, tonight, Sue said, no, I want you to care it. I'm not going to be involved. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> You're making me cry. <laughs> so biblical ministry is not defined as office or profession, but as the self-disclosure of God. And you're ministering out of your gift right now. Uh, and we Both talked about what this is. So we won't go into it in detail now, yep. but the self-disclosure of God to people through his people. Right. Uh, and then we, we noted that Jesus was the ultimate disclosure of God, God's character yep. of God with us, the ultimate minister. And today it's our responsibility to know the Lord and to make him known. That is to disclose him. Right. Okay. So then we went on and Jesus, last week we talked about uh, family. So, mm -hmm. and, and we were all touched by, by that. Do you yeah. want to take that one? Uh, I, what I've got here, Eddie, is that statement, then the scripture that we used before yeah, yeah, we get it, into the yeah, lesson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure anything that I, you know, that, I, that needs to be said, except that family is very important. Uh, but Jesus redefined Jesus, it. Uh, Jesus expanded family yes. to the meaning of, of, of like us tonight. He's drawn us together. We're, we call it a streaming family because we sense that heart connection with, with you all that's connected us together. There's a love that flows by God's Spirit even through this stream. But, and, and this is a family. And so this is what Jesus said, who are my brother? Who are my sisters and my mother? And he looked around at those who were sitting at his feet. And he said, those who hear the word of God and do it. That one is my mother and my sister and my brother. That was his definition of family. Do you want to, you, you, you used Mark 3, 31 through 35. Uh, it's up on the on yeah. the screen there. Do you want to? Because you taught us that the word is not who's my who are my brothers and mother. It's who are my brothers and sisters. Yeah, in 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 Mark's gospel, it it has the word sisters, 
in, in there included who are my mothers. And, and, and it says that his brothers, it also says that it wasn't just his mothers and his brothers. And Mark says his mothers and his brothers and his sisters were all there trying to uh, reach him and get to him. And the key part here is uh, halfway through that passage. Let me see, I've lost it there. He says, um, but he answered them saying, who's my mother or my brothers and sisters? He looked around in the circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers and sisters, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Wow. And, and, and this, he said, he, what he's saying, this is my family. Yes. And, and he looks down at us folks tonight, and, and, yes. and we're here gathered together, sitting at his feet. We're coming Whoa. to learn. And he looks down at us and he says, You're my family. Oh, Hallelujah. Wow. Hallelujah. Whoa. So that's where we, we ended last week. And this week we're, uh, we're talking about what Jesus taught about women. Can women represent God? Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and what this is related to, Genesis 126 says, uh, the old King James says that God created man in his image. Now we know that the, both the Hebrew uh, original and the early Greek translation, the Septuagint, all have a gender inclusive word there. And that's why the New Living Translation says, and God said, let us make people in our image. And the New Revised Standard Version says, and God said, let us make humanity in our image. Because it's not about the creation of a male, it's a cre about the creation of the human species. Now, that, that's important to just say there in passing. Okay. So. But let's, here's what some of the church fathers, did Jesus, did Jesus relate to women this way, that they too bore the image of God? Eddie, Before be, we get to what Jesus said. Yeah, yes. right. Let's, because this is a, a lesson in a course. Uh -huh. uh, let's look at the homework. Okay. For those who want credit sure. or for those who want to fill this out with homework and study, in the textbook, in the Spirit We're Equal, please read page 17 and pages 49 through 56. You see now the there? textbook, is that the blue one, Sue? Yeah, the the yeah. blue, okay. Okay, and the manual, do you have it there? You have it right there? I, I have the manual here. Yep. yep. In the manual, uh, pages 13 and 30. And then Eddie, in the little book, 10 Things Jesus Taught About Women. Yep. This is where we're gonna take s some teaching tonight, pages yep. 24 mm -hmm. through 26. Yep. Then you, uh, have a blog posting on the God's Word to Women mm -hmm. blog. Yeah. The Mothering Heart of God. Yeah. That's a very powerful article. Uh, now, do you article. want to just tell us before well, it, we go no, on? Well, they need the to lesson? read it. I, I, yes. I, 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 right. Well, I'll tell you how it came about. Okay. How this article came about. Years ago, I was speaking for our friends, Jeff and Kathy Good, at uh, Abundant Life Assembly of God. In, in Oviedo, Oviedo, it's a Oviedo. suburb of Orlando. Mm -hmm. And it was Mother's Day, and it's like, okay, what am I gonna preach on Mother's Day? And so I had this idea. I believe the Holy Spirit gave it to me. So I asked a question of the, the audience. I said, I would like for you to help me define what mother's love, a mother's love means to you. Now, most of you, grew up with a mother, how would you give me, just give me one word. And so people out in the congregation, they begin to shout out words like unconditional, uh, enduring, um, and, and, and just all, all of these, the, these words, you know, of, of, of a mother's love, Nurturing, unconditional, caring, uh, caring, enduring, and so on. And I said, you know, so, so finally when it, the, it kind of finished, I said, I'm well, so you know what? I said, that sounds like God's love. <laughs> what you're describing <laughs> sounds like God's love. Yeah. Is it possible, you know, that a mother's love is also an expression of the heart of God as is a father's love? And so I went on with my message from there and out of that I wrote this article and I believe it will bless your socks off yes. uh, as you read it. Okay, so that's homework for this uh, lesson. Okay, Eddie, go for it. So many churches today, some will not allow women to have any kind of role of teaching or ministry. Some allow women more space. They allow them to do certain things. Some, like the church I was talking about earlier, they allow women to minister to serve, and be up on the platform, rule. but they will not allow a woman to have any kind of position of authority, of decision-making. Why is that? Well. 
really it goes back to the Middle Ages and to the influence now uh, uh, of paganism on the Christian church. Mm. Now let me mention this. You remember reading what I said about what this Jewish commentary said about the creation and how that they were created of the very same essence and substance which proving that men and women were equal? Well, you see, that's Old Testament. That, that's even from some ancient rabbis. But in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And Christians were scattered. Before this, the, the center of Christianity was Jerusalem. Most of the original 12 were still in Jerusalem. But after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, Christians scattered and the center of Jerusalem began to move to other places like Antioch of Syria and eventually wound up Rome because of the, the church grew rapidly there. Rome became the center of Christianity. At one time it was Alexandria in Egypt and then it, Rome became the center of Christianity. And, um, and they could no longer, they no longer looked to Jerusalem and to their Jewish roots. And uh, many of the early Christian leaders, uh, uh, we call them Christian apologists, they wanted to reach the Greeks. And so they started trying to build bridges to the Greek culture through Greek philosophy and trying to show that Christianity could be acceptable to Greek philosophy. And they begin to build bridges uh, to the Greek world and the Greek speaking world and the Greek way of thinking. But as some, and because they wanted, they were honest and wanting to reach the Greek thinking world. But as someone has said, when you build a bridge, traffic runs in both directions. Mm -hmm. And in building those bridges of wanting to evangelize the Greek world and the Greek world of the philosophers and the intelligentsia, the traffic began to flow back the other way and they began to be influenced. And one area that began to be influenced was in this whole area of male and female relationships. Famous philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, they did not have that Jewish concept of creation and men and women being created of the very same essence and substance and therefore equal like the rabbis had said. And the church fathers, many of them, became very profoundly influenced as they were interacting with Greek thinking and Greek philosophy became very influenced by this more than they were from even the Old Testament scriptures about creation. And one problem was, let, let's take Augustine, who's usually considered the greatest of the church fathers. Tremendous influence on both Catholic, Catholicism and Protestantism. Augustine did not know Hebrew. And he wasn't even all that good in Greek. He wrote in Latin. So Augustine didn't understand that Genesis 1.26 was about the creation of humanity. And so he did not believe that the woman in her own self was created in the image of God. In fact, here's what Augustine taught. Augustine said that the man on his own, apart from the woman, is the image of God. But the woman on her own, apart from the man, is not created in the image of God. She only reflects the image of God when she's married and joined up with the man. But the man on his own reflects the image of God. The woman is dependent on the man to be able to reflect the image of God. See, this is what he taught. So it put the woman in a very lower, inferior, subservient place simply by that way of thinking. And then after that way of thinking, it was very easy then to take some of Paul's statements, isolated statements, two of his statements and say, oh, that fits in really well with this. And so to create this whole theological system that demeans and marginalizes and keeps women from being able to freely function in their gifts and their callings. Do you see how important this is after centuries yeah. of this distortion, perversion mm -hmm. yeah. that has been laid on women and men, that it's we're breaking up decades, centuries of tradition.
this is no small thing and we need each other to give strength to one another to pray for one another to get this working in our hearts and lives sharing it with others yeah. and pushing back the tide of this cursed wrong teaching yeah amen Augustine said that the female state should be looked upon as a deformity. Mm. And also, so I remember him, I remember reading, this shows how, how demeaning his attitude was towards uh, the female state. Now, there were good things about Augustine. I believe he was a true Christian, but he was very much affected in his thinking by the, the, the pagan world. Uh, he was a womanizer before he became saved and was schooled in, in the uh, Greek and pagan way of thinking. And when he became a Christian, and, and I have no doubt when I read his conversion experience that it was very real, but he was impacted so much. And I remember reading another time, uh, Susan, about he was discussing about God making the man a helper. Now again, he didn't know Hebrew, so he was not able, he didn't know the things that you have shared in your book. Mm -hmm. And here he is, esteemed as the greatest mm -hmm. church father and theologian of them all. Wow. Wow. But when he was discussing this helper, he asked the question, now what kind of helper w would this helper be? He said, uh, it can't be a, a helper to help the man in his physical labors because uh, a man would be better for that. So, you know, it can't be that. Uh, and he said, it's not a, it can't be a helper on a, a, a rational and a reasonable level because uh, a, 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 another man would be mo a, a better companion a mm -hmm. uh, for conversation than a woman. So he decided the only way the woman could be a helper, that God created the woman to be a helper, was for continuing for procreation. Wow. In other words, for have, having children, that that was wow. the only way she, could, she was and to be you, a helper. You know, Eddie, that developed into a, a philosophy in the Middle Ages whereby w uh, a woman was a worker and a womb. I'll say it again, a worker and a womb. And, and I feel a sadness in it, my it, spirit when yep. I tell about how Augustine yep. thought about this. That, that women were not good companions for fellowship and conversing. He said, oh, you, you, the, the woman is no good for that. Um, another man is better for conversing and having a rational and fellowship and conversation. Really sad. She, she's no good for helping him physically, another man for that. So the only way she's a helper is to have Working. sex and, and have mm -hmm. children and keep the, the human race going. Yeah. That was the only thing she was good for, being a helper. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that is, so is very sad. sad. And so that colored all of his theologies and so on. And, see, and what is said, mm -hmm. so much of the theology of both Catholicism and Protestantism is based on Augustine's theology. Mm. Well, yeah. Augustine also had a very extreme doctrine on original sin. He believed that, he believed that we inherited at birth... Uh, Adam's and Eve's guilt, or he would probably give it, say Eve's guilt, yeah. that we inherit at yeah. birth their guilt. Not just, not just a bent towards sin, which, which is true, which the Bible teaches, but actually the guilt. And so he believed in, in baptizing by infants, and he believed that if a newborn infant was not baptized immediately and it died, it would go to hell. You know, I have a sad story about yeah. that. Before my dad came to know the Lord, and that happened when he was, what, 72 through... 74, yeah. 74 I believe, through, yeah. through your ministry. Somewhere in there, yeah. Before that, many years before that, when I was about 17, we lived in a place called Kingston, New Brunswick, and we attended an Anglican church. And the a baby died before it was christened. And so the uh, rector, God bless him, was so legalistic that he refused to allow the family to bury that baby in the consecrated cemetery in next the church to the cemetery. church. And Dad, at that point, Dad wrote that that rector off because in Dad's heart he knew that that was wrong and that was cruel. He had more sense than the rector did. Yes. Just a little yeah. personal side yeah. note. Yeah, there, so true. Well, you see, folks. I don't know why this brings a sadness in my heart because it, it's sad in God's Because it, 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 it has destroyed so many lives. It mm -hmm. has quenched so many gifts, so mm -hmm. many callings. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It, it has weakened the church through the centuries. And so what, what we're sharing with you tonight is so very important. I'll mention one other. Sue has a number in her book. If you don't have this book, it's available in the Kindle edition on Amazon. If you go to Amazon and look up Susan Hyatt, just search. It'll bring up this book in the spirit we're equal. And it's available in the Kindle format. This book has been through two printings. And God has provided We're out of print both right times, now. and I'm in the process of tweaking it to get it to the printer, and we're receiving uh, gifts at this time. Without even trying, there's been $3,000 have come in that's in a separate fund. Mm-hmm. They've been, it's been given for that, yeah. for reprinting it this take, book. It'll take a and, lot more. But and you're going to edit start. it and update it and bring uh-huh. in some things that, yeah, that you and I have because learned. Because that, I wrote since that in the 80s. and it was, it, it was published in 1998, the first time. I'm sorry, I wrote it in the 90s, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So anyway, so, so, so this, this is... But yeah, there's a, a lot of good stuff in yeah, there. That, yeah, but, but I'm saying I'm feeling a sadness in my spirit mm-hmm, as I'm talking about this That's because I know spirit. it's wreaked so much havoc yep. on the church, on the body of Christ, and, and weakened our witness to the world. Mm-hmm. Another great theologian, Thomas Aquinas, who, who is considered the greatest, the Catholics consider him the greatest theologian. And, uh, and he, he, like Augustine, he did not believe that the woman possessed the image of God in the way that the man does. And he believed that the woman was spiritually inferior. And uh, he said, this is a direct quote. He says, woman is defective and misbegotten. Isn't that awful? He also said that, uh, that woman is naturally subject to man. Mm. Because in man, the discernment of wisdom predominates. Oh. Now, folks, these, these are quotes from the greatest theologians of the Middle Ages. And this is the kind of thinking that came into Christianity and into the church. Now, going back to Jesus, Jesus did not relate this way. Jesus did not relate to women in this way. By the time, now Jesus came along because there had been so much Greek influence even into the land of Israel and into the Jewish way of thinking. So much of the oral tradition of Judaism as we have shown you had come to the place where they too were excluding women and pushing women out to the margins. But Jesus, when you look at him in light of all of this, he was a real revolutionary because he treated women with respect. He treated them with dignity. And, uh, and he even used some feminine, feminine images showing that women too can represent God the same as men can represent God. Let me just mention some of these. The first one I'm going to mention is Luke chapter 15 verses 9 through 10. And this is in the same area where he's, he's using parables to show how much God rejoices over a lost sinner who returns to him. He uses different parables in, here in the same area to show that the person who is turned away from God and rebellious against God that God is not angry and has shut them out, but God is pursuing them and wooing them. And when they turn to Him and come home to Him, God rejoices. What's that passage? This is Luke 15, 9 through 10. Now, in, in one of the parables, and they're right together there in Luke 15, He uses a male image to show this. The prodigal son, the father, the, the, the loving, gracious father who when his, one of his, his youngest son wants his inheritance now, the father gives it to him and he goes out and he wastes it, comes to the end of himself. And he wonders because he's, he, he, he has so dishonored his father and dishonored everything he was brought up to be, he wonders if he'll be accepted. And so he returns home and the, and, and the father sees him coming and runs and embraces him and, 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 and throws a feast for him and so on and puts the best robe on him. But then Jesus tells another parable to illustrate. And so there is, there is singing and rejoicing when the prodigal comes home. My goodness, if you happen to be a prodigal, God is just waiting for you to come back to him. 
and all of heaven rejoices. But then he tells another parable, but he uses a feminine image in this situation. And he tells this time it's about a woman. <laughs> And who's the woman? And the woman, in, in, just like in the other parable, no. the, the father represented God. In this, the, the woman, woman is representing God, God. And the right. coins are representing people. And when she finds the one that was lost, she calls everybody. Just it, It's a similar story to rejoice. So God, or so Jesus uses a woman to paint a picture of what God is like. Let's read the and story. And how he feels about lost people. Or what woman, having ten coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp? You see, this is illustrating the same story as the prodigal son and the same story as, as the shepherd and the one sheep that went astray. This is a parable illustrating the same story but using different figures, using different metaphors. Or what woman? And so Jesus... Jesus didn't have a problem using women to represent God. Or what woman having ten silver coins if she loses one coin does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, what did she do? She calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Now, Jesus gives the interpretation. Listen to the interpretation. What, what is this il 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 illustrating? He says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Wow. Glory to God. And but then the, here's another but, great... But the whole point here is... And we'll go back and we'll talk about how Jesus called God Abba Father. Mm -hmm. But right now we're showing how Jesus did not diminish womanhood. This was another and, time. And the fact that the woman was created in the image and likeness of God the same as the man. Okay, th say that part again. The woman was created in the image and likeness of God the same therefore, as the man. Therefore, therefore... So both men and women can represent God. Exactly. They are representatives there, of God. There's the crux of the issue I've right got there. to say this because this is so important in this modern world in which we live. There was a fall. Genesis 3. And in the fall, that image, it was not destroyed and erased, but it was marred. It was diminished. It was damaged in both men and women. And one not more or less than the other. But you see, in Jesus Christ, one thing the redemptive work of Jesus Christ has come to do is to restore back that image. In fact, Romans 8, 29 says this is God's ultimate goal in, in salvation. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, both men and women, to be conformed to the image of his Son. What's that passage again, Eddie? That is Romans 8, 29. So, so my friends, there is a vestige of the image of God in the world today that is why we can see flashes of, of goodness and nobility even in non-Christians. And sometimes this happens in times of disaster and so on that, that, that people, even non-Christians, will, will show concern and caring and so on. That's because there is still a vestige remaining of that image of God. But, it, it's, it, but, but it's not there all the time. People well, it's outside not, of God it's tend there, to be it's, selfish. It's there, but it's not active all the time. People tend to be selfish in pursuing their own desires and even willing to step on other people. But also, this explains why there's evil in the world, why there's continual wars and fighting and killing and evil and, 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 and competition in so many ways because that image of God was damaged and marred at the fall and the only way it can be restored is not through religion but through a living relationship with Jesus Christ and I will say this 
It, it's not restored all at once. It is a progress process. The Bible calls it sanctification, and it's a lifelong process of us walking out every day, seeking to trust Him every day, to walk in obedience to Him, and the Spirit of God is working in us, changing us, transforming us, and making us more and more like unto Him. Hallelujah. Amen. But the point is, Man does not represent God more than woman represents God. God created, it's clear from Genesis 1.26, that God created both man and woman in His image. Now what, is, what we have to be careful of is that we don't turn around and try to create Him in our image. You see, God is not like us. We, any likeness there is we are like Him. Not completely like Him, but we derive a likeness from Him. And we get in trouble when we, as you just said, when we try to make God in our, our image. image. Yeah. Always. Think yes. about that. And there is a little book, a classic little book people have heard me mention before. Every Bible school student, every pastor, every serious believer should have to read the little book by J.B. Phillips called Your God is Too Small. It blows the... They are inadequate concepts of God right out of the water. Mm. Some we don't even realize we have. And, and as those truths come into our mind, it's so exciting and so liberating. That's All so right, true, Sue. So you were going to, did you do both of the passages? No, there? There, there's, there's another passage here. This is, this is a powerful passage, a very moving, a heart-moving passage where Jesus is looking over the city of Jerusalem. Here he has come. Their Messiah has come. God incarnate has come, reaching out to His covenant people, the ones who, who, whom God has been their people for centuries. Of course, there's been these backslidings and so on, and God has sent the prophets and different ones calling His people back to Him. And now the promised one has come, but, but for the most part, as a nation, they have rejected Him. So give me the scripture there. In Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38, Jesus stands and He looks at the city, that beloved city of Jerusalem, and He begins to lament. And you can hear the cry of His heart, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. And he says, how often I wanted to gather you together. Now he is speaking here as God. Because Jesus' existence did not begin in Bethlehem. Jesus was God incarnate in the flesh. And when he says here, how often I wanted to gather your children together, he's talking about the past centuries and past generations, how God was continually calling Israel, his people, back to him and sending prophets and, and raising up scribes. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I gather you together? And he looked for a metaphor that would express his heart for his people. And he found a feminine metaphor of a mother hen who in a time of a storm who sees, who see, hears the thunder and sees the lightning and, and, and the wind begins to blow and a mother hen, she clucks and calls her chicks and she spreads out her wings and covers those chicks to protect them from the coming storm. And Jesus says, that's how my heart has been for you so often. I saw the dangers coming because of your backslidings and because of your sins. And I called for you. I clucked to you. I sent prophets to you. I raised up scribes. And like a mother hen, I wanted to spread my wings and protect you from the coming storms, but you would not. In other words, you rejected it. This shows us the power of the human will, my friends, too. This shows that we have a choice. Oh, God will woo, He will draw, He will convict, but He will never force. Jesus said, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. 
See, because you were not willing, your house is left to you desolate. Oh, tonight, let's be willing. Let's respond to his clucks. Let's respond to his call, to his woos. Don't ever turn away those wooings of God's Spirit in your heart, that, that those callings, those clucks of the Holy Spirit. Don't ever turn away from those. Don't ever deny those. Respond to those. Let Him spread His wings over you with loving care and protection. But because you were not willing, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall not see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's five after eight. We're going to wrap this up so maybe we can deal with, with how God, what that meant about Abba Father. And, uh, and Jesus, yes, he related to God as Father. No problem with that. Uh, but he wasn't wanting us to picture like Michelangelo played it, <laughs> painted on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapter. Uh, beautiful painting of God and uh, interesting, this is very interesting, Michelangelo was an Italian and he was painting for an Italian Pope. So the, the, the picture of God he painted was a, a male figure with obvious Italian features. <laughs> He was creating God in his image. He was creating image. God in his image. He created an Italian God, a male Italian God with a long beard. Wow. <laughs> Think about it. Jesus, when, when Jesus called God, uh, one word he used for God, a word he used was Abba. And it was, a, it was not a formal word for Father. It was an intimate word that was only used by children in the household. It was not used by servants or slaves. And it, it would be similar to to words like Papa or Daddy, something more endearing, something more affectionate. And for Jesus, it was an expression of, uh, 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 of this personal, intimate relationship with the Almighty. And all oh, that's what God is calling us to, that we would know Him, that we would not create Him in our image because God is Spirit. He transcends everything of heaven and earth. In fact, in the Old Testament, he commanded them, one of the Ten Commandments that he commanded there in, in Deuteronomy 4.15, he told them not to make any kind of a carved image to represent him. He said, in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal, etc. God said, don't you try to reduce me down to anything of this earth. Don't make any, try to make any likeness of me, either a male or a female or an animal or anything, because I am bigger than, I transcend anything and everything of this earth. What passage, Deuteronomy what? That's Deuteronomy 4.15. That needs, uh, people can benefit, we can all benefit from just taking a deep breath and thinking about that that you've just said, Eddie, yeah. that we're not to make anything, we're not to make anything, uh, take it, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're not to try to make represent God, God with, and say this is a representative of God. Yes, we both male and female, we are representatives of God, but we're not God. That's right. He made us in His image and likeness, but we're not Him. Right. He's he bigger than He transcends he, he's us. Bigger than, and, yeah. and so, so don't make any image down here and try to say this, this, this is God. No, no. God transcends. He's bigger than anything of this earth. And, and, and you know, I, I, I just have that, I, I don't know how to describe it, a softness, a kind of a brokenness in my heart. God wants people to know how much He cares. And that's what Jesus was expressing for Jerusalem. And he expresses that for people tonight. The key is we've got to be willing. We've got to respond. Oh, my friends, don't ever stop responding to God. Don't ever stop responding. No, no matter how often you feel like you fail or you come up short, don't ever stop running to God. Don't ever stop running to Him. Don't ever stop responding to those the wooings of His Spirit, the callings of His Spirit. And I just want to pray for you now. Lord, I thank you. I, I want to invite you in your heart. I want to invite you to come now. <laughs>
Oh, I want to invite you to come now and hide under his wings. You know, there's a, there, there, there's a passage in the Psalms. Maybe Jesus had this in mind because Jesus knew the Old Testament scriptures. There's a passage in the Psalms that says, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his pinions or under his wings you shall trust. Picturing God again like this, this bird or like Jesus, this mother hen, protective. Oh, I want to invite you to come right now in faith and hide under his wing. Whatever is troubling you right now, whatever is coming against you, whatever is making you afraid, I invite you now by faith to come. And by faith, and you can say it out loud, you want to say, Jesus, I come. And I choose to hide under your wing. <laughs> I choose to receive your protective care of my life. I invite you to come now and, and receive his protective care for you. Because you are willing. You're not like the people he spoke of there at that time, Jerusalem, but you are not willing. You are willing and you're coming. And you're saying, Lord, I receive your protective care. I choose to hide under your wings. And under your wings, I trust. And there shall no evil befall me, neither shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. For you shall give your angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. Wonderful promises. When you're under his care. Glory to God. Lord, and I thank you right now. I believe right now that... That, that people are finding refreshing for their souls. <laughs> oh, they're finding, I believe, even, even a touch of strength and healing in their physical bodies. Peace in their minds. A new confidence of your faithfulness. God, I praise you for what you're doing right now in hearts and lives. All over the world, all, everywhere this stream goes and everywhere it will go. You want to sing that, that chorus with me we sang earlier? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Oh, they are new every morning they're new every morning great is thy faithfulness O Lord great is thy faithfulness oh that 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 that's that just blesses my heart Great is thy faithfulness, the steadfast of the Lord, it never ceases. God is, is imprinting, he's writing that on your heart tonight. Somebody's heart, God's writing that on your heart tonight. I'm just going to get a little bit, bit higher. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And my capo just needs to work a little bit better for me. There it is. They are new every morning. Oh, they're new every morning. And great is thy faithfulness, O oh Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. There we got it. Yes, the steadfast of the Lord, it never fails. This is changing the topic a bit, but before people start leaving, I want it you to please hold up the manual there of Valerie's called okay. Divine Health. Okay, this is a 
this is a, a manual that I'm tweaking for Valerie Owen. And uh, Valerie is, <laughs> she is a really wonderful Bible teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and she teaches out of years of experience. So I, I tell you, whenever I have the opportunity to work on her material, I can feel the faith. I can I, it's a tangible thing. Mm. So uh, it's been my privilege the last few days to be tweaking this particular manual that um, I helped her with previously, uh, but she uses it to teach a course called Divine Health. Mm. And that will be one of the courses she teaches in the new uh, trimester. Could people buy a copy of this, this if they wanted to? This is what I'm, at, I'm a bit slow getting to it right now, but yes, this is what I'm I'm thinking if, if we could ask Valerie if she would be willing for people to buy this. Uh, uh, she's printing up uh, 60, copies for her copies. Bible school students for this right, course. But right. if we she did say she wanted to print an extra, so right. I, think, I think that could work. So but we'll I'm, have to see I, what the cost would be. I guess uh, if people wanted to show them, how, show them the number of pages and how many lessons is it? Uh, Oh, good question, Sue. Uh, 270 oh, or something. Uh, oh, this has 170. 170, okay. And it'd 14 be, chapters. It'd be wonderful if um, if somehow we could get the, actually get the, her teaching on video out of that. Yeah. Because there are friends of ours that I feel could really... Um, benefit there will really I, be helped. by God's grace there will be a time where we will be able to facilitate that that sort of yeah. thing Valerie and others teaching in in the meantime uh, that manual is available um, if you're interested please email us and let us know